And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Joshua P. Warren, investigator who pioneers the amazing relationship between the mind, energy, matter, and strange phenomena. Author of over 20 best-selling books, including Use the Force, A Jedi's Guide to the Law of Attraction, he has appeared on numerous TV programs on History, Discovery, Nat Geo, Animal Planet, Sci-Fi, TLC, and starred on the Travel Channel series Paranormal Paparazzi. Joshua, thank you for joining me and welcome. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you, Jeff. Joshua, how did you get into all this paranormal stuff in the first place? Well, I was born in Asheville, North Carolina, the heart of the Blue Ridge Mountains, some of the oldest mountains in the world. And on both my mother's side and father's side, my family has been in that area since the 16 and 1700s. And my mother was one of 10 children. My father was one of seven. So this giant family growing up there had all kinds of interesting experiences going back generations. And I grew up hearing about a lot of strange things that happened in the family that opened my mind, surviving in the wilderness, all the old ghost stories, the folklore, the legends of the Appalachians, the Native American tales. And when I was a teenager, I took an interest in writing some of them down and writing some stories that were even fiction uh, inspired by that. I started publishing books and newspaper articles. By the time I was 18, I think I'd published three or four books already. And that area was a perfect place to inspire my interest because I grew up probably about an hour from Brown Mountain, which is famous for the Brown Mountain lights, these mysterious multicolored balls of light that have been floating around this ridge for hundreds of years. They are unexplained to this day. And if you keep drawing a line east from there, well, you hit this section in the middle of North Carolina known as the Devil's Tramping Ground, where this big barren circle exists and nobody can explain why nothing will grow there. And they say that the devil will walk around in circles at night, mulling over the evil things he's going to do to people. And you keep drawing that line east, you finally hit the coast of North Carolina, where the first English settlement was attempted on Roanoke Island, and they all vanished. It's known as the Lost Colony to this day, no explanation. And if you continue drawing that line out, you eventually hit more or less the island of Bermuda, the top point of the so-called Bermuda Triangle. So I was in the midst of this alignment of paranormal activity uh, that included ghosts and UFOs and psychic phenomena, stories of angels and demons and everything in between. And in fact, at one point, uh, I even decided to go live in the Bermuda Triangle for five years, something we might get to later. But the point is, as I started studying all this, I became a big fan of this great quote by Charles Fort that you can measure a circle beginning anywhere. And what that means is I got into paranormal investigation from the point of view of, uh, well, my, I was interested in ghosts. But if you, you enter this thing called the paranormal and you stick with it long enough, you find eventually ghosts will lead you to UFOs and UFOs will lead you to cryptids and all that will lead you to psychic phenomena. And you'll find that it all kind of ties together because after all, this is a you and I verse. And that means that after 30 years of professionally studying all this stuff, uh, I'm now interested in the complete phantasmagoria of weirdness and the direction it's leading us as we go deeper and deeper into this idea of other dimensions and inner experiences. I love how you said about the circle of paranormal, because one thing that I have found is that a lot of near-death experiencers start having UFO contact or sightings after the experience, if not even seeing ETs during their experience. And I think they're all tied together, just like you're saying. And well, you, you have these kind of hot spots, sometimes we call them flaps. You have a situation in which one paranormal manifestation may get the spotlight, but there's a lot of other stuff that's happening in the community, I think the best example of this would be when Mothman appeared in Point Pleasant, West Virginia in 1967. 
Of course, Mothman got all the headlines for obvious reasons. He was the, the, the star of the show. But actually, there were many other things that were happening in the community at the same time. People experiencing an uptick in what they would consider poltergeist activity. Lots of uh, additional UFO sightings. You had the men in black popping up, running around town, intimidating people. And so what you find is that um, it almost seems that we have this thing that I think of as interdimensional weather, that every once in a while, there is some kind of a cosmic disturbance, and there is a convergence of these forces that allow things that are usually separate to come together. Um, let, let me put it this way. It's kind of like, you know, if you go to Oklahoma most of the time, you're probably not going to see a tornado. But when the conditions are just right, voila, this truly amazing and awe-inspiring, perfectly formed geometri geometrical thing appears, and it has unbelievable power, and it's there for a little while, and then it's gone. I think the same kind of thing happens between dimensions, and there are these temporary portals that open up. Some places are more conducive to it than others. We hear these stories about places like Skinwalker Ranch or the Bermuda Triangle, or even here, you know, I'm living in Las Vegas now. This is where I have my house and my laboratory and my workshop and my studio, and it's part of what they call the Nevada Triangle, which has even more activity, believe it or not, than the Bermuda Triangle. And so there are these certain places where you are more uh, where more prone or places that are more prone to this sort of activity. But um, boy, when all the factors come together and you have that window of time when something paranormal is formed, it's a collection of these events that all sort of transpire during a limited period of time. And that's why it's so hard to study. That's why it's hard to study a tornado. They appear, they disappear, and you have a short bit of data there to work with. And it's the same thing with paranormal activity. What are the boundaries of the Nevada Triangle that you speak of? The boundaries are Las Vegas, Reno, Nevada, and Fresno, California. Hmm. And in that area, there have been over 2,000 planes disappear over the past 60 years. Way more than have disappeared in the Bermuda Triangle. Now, of course, in the Bermuda Triangle, you have some of the deepest water in the world. You know, I lived in Puerto Rico for years, and right outside of Puerto Rico, you have the Puerto Rico Trench, second deepest spot in, in the world's oceans. The only place deeper is the Marianas Trench in the Pacific Ocean. It's understandable that if a, if a boat or a ship goes down over that kind of depth in the ocean, that you're probably, you know, not going to have much luck finding it. But here in the Nevada Triangle, we have a lot of barren land, and not only that, you have military bases all over the place that are constantly scanning the skies and surveilling everything. How do you have over 2,000 planes disappear in that triangle? And then also, if you go to this day to the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department website, they have a whole section about how many people, people vanish every day in the Las Vegas area. Wow. And and warnings on that. But that's just part of it. It's, we're not just talking about disappearances. We're talking about an incredible amount of ghostly activity out here. The UFOs are a given. I mean, I, I actually own property in Rachel, Nevada, right next to Area 51, where I do research. Um, and then when it comes to just uh, some of the, the psychic experiences that people have around here, you have to realize Nevada is the number one gold producer in North America. Uh, it's number four in the entire world, even though it's known as the silver state because it has so much silver as well. So you look at this you know, rugged landscape and you'd have no idea that it's just chock full of gold and silver and other minerals. And these are highly conductive minerals. And so what happens is you have this very dry climate, so dry that we're practically right next to Death Valley. You have these strong winds that blow through here, whipping up all of these powerful electrostatic charges. You have all of these weird telluric currents that are flowing through these conductive metals in the ground, and it all converges to create these very complex, spontaneous bursts of electrostatic and electromagnetic energy. And even though we can't explain paranormal phenomena, which is why we call it paranormal, we do know there seems to be some connection between these things 
and these bizarre bursts of electromagnetic and electrostatic fields. And so this is just the, the perfect laboratory to study how all those forces come together, not to mention the dramatic history here going back to the Old West and then all the modern history with the gangsters and then the fact that to this very day, People come to Las Vegas because they want to have a highly emotional experience. They leave and they're either exhilarated or they want to go kill themselves, depending on how it goes. <laughs> I was wondering if some of those disappearances are people who end up in Lake Mead for not paying oh, yeah. gambling debts. Could, could very well be. You know, they, they found quite a few in Lake Mead, but honestly, not as many as I was expecting. Of course, uh, that doesn't mean they're not still down there, but... Um, you know, it's that's the thing about this whole town. Um, it it was a place that kept secrets. I mean, everybody knows what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, and so um, there's no telling what has happened in this area. So, so that's contributed this kind of layer of human drama to the the physical complexity of the energy fields here, and those are the things. Those are the ingredients that you need to create. Uh, a good haunted place or a place where people have these types of otherworldly experiences. You came to my attention by your work on UFOs and you're shooting videos of them. Can you tell my audience about how you got into this and what your findings are? Sure. Um, well, I had always seen some weird lights when I was a kid and I was growing up as soon as I was 16 years old and I started camping up at Brown Mountain, I would see these balls of light that people would describe around Brown Mountain, but sometimes they wouldn't just stay on the mountain. I actually got video footage of one of these lights rising up into the sky and disappearing. So I'd seen weird stuff like that going way back. And then when I was in Puerto Rico uh, studying the Bermuda Triangle, and again, I lived there for five years in a town called Boca Rum, uh, there was this phenomenal piece of footage that Homeland Security captured of one of these very traditional, what they often call now UAP, flying around the Aguadilla Airport there and bouncing in and out. And I did an, an extensive investigation of that. But the first time that I saw something that really blew my mind, it was here in Nevada. Uh, this was, oh gosh, uh, I'm not sure, maybe like 2011 or something like that. And I had come out here, I was invited to be a speaker at a conference in Laughlin, Nevada. And I met my friend Dean Warsing there. And uh, he had a pair of third generation, actually he had two or three pairs of third generation night vision goggles. And so we went out into the desert one night. There was just three or four of us there. And I looked up and lo and behold, here was this gigantic V-shaped craft that was only visible through the third generation night vision that was very slowly and quietly making its way over our heads. It took about a minute and a half and it was the most unbelievable thing I'd ever seen. I was instantly hooked on doing more research at that time in Nevada of what these UFOs are. And I can't say for certain that that wasn't some kind of a man-made like a military secret craft or something. I don't know, but it was something that was a UFO to me. So when I decided to move here six years ago, I was looking into different ways of trying to capture what was out there. And I was using night vision and I would get a lot of interesting stuff. My friend, Jason Sirachi, he even takes people out with night vision now. If you go to uh, VegasUFOs.com, next time you're in town, you can make a reservation. He'll take you out and he'll show you what the sky looks like around here through third gen night vision. But you know, when all of the, the new information started coming out over the past five years or so about, um, you know, these pilots coming forth and talking about um, what they were seeing over, over the Pacific and the Tic Tacs, et cetera, you had a lot of these pilots saying that these craft are often flying over 1,000 miles per hour. And... So I was thinking, well, they could be zipping around us all the time then, and we just couldn't see them. It'd be almost like, you know, bullets flying around. And so I decided to purchase a high-speed camera. And you have to realize that even though my house is in Las Vegas, as the crow flies, Area 51 is only about 90 miles from my house. So if a craft were flying a 1,000 a, a miles per hour, 
he could be over my house in less than five seconds. Uh, and so that means if they're going that fast, they could be practically anywhere at any, any time. So I got this camera called a Sony RX-02, and it's capable of, of shooting 1,000 frames per second, which is called high-speed photography. And for those who don't know what I'm talking about, what that means is it produces true slow motion. This is not like filming something and then slowing it down. It's like literally taking 1,000 pictures every single second. And when you do that, uh, you get all so much information that a two-second clip it stretches out to like a minute long. That's how, how, how much it slows everything down. This is literally the kind of photography that you would use if you wanted to capture a bullet when you see like these documentaries where they shoot a bullet into an apple or that kind of – that's high-speed photography. But I, I wasn't aware of, of many people, if anybody really, uh, especially in this area, uh, pointing those at the sky. And, and because that it does take uh, 1,000 frames per second, um, which is uh, an, almost an unimaginable, it can only do, my camera can only do two seconds. So I have to get really lucky if I'm going to get something. So I went out probably for, you know, a month or so, and I never got anything. And then last year, 2023 in April, so it's actually been about exactly a year ago, I went into my backyard here at my house. And I shot uh, over two dozen clips over my house and got nothing except in one. And in this one, there is this object. Now, this is all happening in less than two seconds. This white ball, it travels across the screen from left to right. As it gets halfway across the screen, it shoots a second object out of it. And then it continues going to the right and then makes this incredible 90 degree turn. And as that's happening, a third object, which looks kind of like a, a dark cylindrical object, goes shooting by on the bottom left. All this happens in less than two seconds. I couldn't believe that and I couldn't explain it. And so I, I was inspired to do more high-speed photography. And then last month, I took my camera to a place that's about an hour and a half from here called Spirit Mountain. It's a sacred place. It's actually a protected national monument now. And Spirit Mountain is where many of the local Native American tribes say life originated. This is a, a portal, basically, that this is the spot from which all human life came. It is the most sacred spot on Earth. And so I went there with a few friends shot a bunch of clips and and numerous clips as we were there actually meditating being very respectful doing some rituals with some prayers i captured again some very strange objects that look very tangible shooting overhead and um so you know i put this video on youtube if you go to joshua p if you go to youtube and just type in my name joshua p warren then um, you can, you'll see a lot of stuff. But one of the most recent videos is, it says something like UFOs, UAP over Spirit Mountain. And you can see all the footage that I've been telling you about. And so I believe that, look, I can't explain what these are. I don't believe that there's any evidence that this these are created by bugs or birds. Because if you shoot at 1,000 frames per second and you get a bird or a bug, you can see them very clearly. If you go and you look up footage that's shot a thousand frames per second of bugs or birds, you can see it's a bug or a bird. These things don't look like that. I don't know what they are, but I want to inspire more people to go out, get one of these cameras. You can get one of these cameras just like the one I have now off of Amazon for less than a thousand dollars. Start pointing these things at the sky. And I think if we do that, we are going to be astounded by how much more frequently these things are flying around us in broad daylight every single day. I know that you mentioned that you have YouTube videos of your UFO videos. Yeah. Do you mind just showing us one real quickly? Sure. This is, again, a thousand frames per second. And I'm going to get back to that in a minute. I shot that over Spirit Mountain. And... um this is the one that some people said, how, how do you know that's not just a bug or a bird? Well, before I get into that, because I'm going to go more in depth on that one in a second. Here I am sitting in my backyard, and I'm talking about 
you know, what the high speed photography is and why it's important. And when I went up to Spirit Mountain, here I am over Spirit Mountain, and you can see that um, I actually have some crystals down there, but that's another conversation for another day. Uh, when I was up at Spirit Mountain and I was taking pictures, that's when I got that flashy thing that we'll dig into more here in a moment. But first, I want to go over uh, what I was capturing here. Of course, I there's my camera. Okay, so this is what I was capturing in my backyard. Now, this high-speed photography, again, this is like a, just a little balloon or something here, and you can see how that it looks during the high-speed um, just being dropped on the floor. There's just a, a ball in my swimming pool. There's just my little dog scratching herself. This shows you how much it slows things down. So in this two-second clip that you're about to see here, first off, and I mean, again, it's amazing that this happens in less than two seconds. You'll see that there is this white object. It's like a white ball that's going to appear here on screen. And when the white ball appears, uh, let's see, it's about to pop up here at this point. I'm just showing you literally the process that I use. Okay, now here is this white ball. And as it moves from right to left, watch this object shoot out of it on the upper left. Boom, right there. Now here it is again, the white object's moving right to left and then boom, this other white object shoots out of it on the top left. And then that original object, it keeps going to the right until all of a sudden it makes this incredible 90 degree turn, which would be absolutely impossible for any kind of a, a, a typical uh, aircraft. And while that was going on, I, I didn't even notice at first. In the bottom left-hand corner was this other object, this sort of black cylindrical object that was flying through at the same moment. So in less than two seconds, all that stuff happened. So you have, you have one object that's speeding across, ejecting a second object. The first object makes this impossible turn. And then we have this third object. And then after that, of course, is when I went to Spirit Mountain. This is the place I was telling you about, which is considered the most sacred spot by many of the local Indians, the Mojave, the, um, the Maricopa. Um, the, this is the creation spot. This is the origin spot for human life. And so here I am next to a big container full of crystals. And again, that's something I'll be talking about uh, in the near future, a project I'm working on. So I was just taking pictures by placing my Sony down, and you will see something weird. Look at that thing. It's very, very tangible, and it looks like it has a metallic color, and it looks like there's some kind of a pulsing energy coming from each side. Now, I, I know a guy who is an engineer, and he contacted me immediately as soon as he saw this, and he said, that looks a lot like RCS thrusters that are used to keep spacecraft on course by adjusting their orientation, their altitude, etc. And so you can see it looks like a metallic cylindrical object. And this is what some people have said, well, maybe it's just a bird. But the thing is, if you see footage of birds shot at a thousand frames per second, they're very clearly birds. And this is moving at such an incredible speed. Uh, I don't know that it's possible to calculate the exact speed because that I don't know its altitude above me. Um, but what's I think especially interesting about it is that I was able to capture this thing from a different angle as well. So here you can see it's been moving from the left to the right. And Notice this, again, this persistent kind of flashing or pulsing aspect to it. And it, it's possible that that's just a reflection. I, I don't know if it's an actual energy or if it's a reflection of some kind. But when it, when it goes from right to left, which I believe is about to happen now, look, right to left, there it's zooming through. You can see it flashing, but it's farther away now. That's possibly even more interesting because you can see that this object is so far away that there's almost no detail there, and yet it's still flashing. This is traveling so fast that it would be invisible to the naked eye. And by the way, if you take something like a hummingbird, a hummingbird is able to flap its wings at about, um, 
uh, let's see, about 70 to 100 times per second. At the very most, I think a hummingbird has been documented flapping its wings at 200 times per second. We're talking about a thousand frames per second being being shot here. And uh, so look, is some of that stuff um, explainable? Perhaps. Is some of it unexplainable? I think so. But until somebody sends me a piece of footage saying, well, look, I shot this footage of, a, of an insect or a bird, and here's what it looks like. It looks exactly like that. Then I'm going to say it's still an open question. I definitely don't know how we explain the one that's shooting from left to right that has this other object that shoots out of it and then does the 90 degree turn. That I mean, So all of these are interesting for different reasons, but um, I'm going to sort of uh, up my game here and start getting some cameras that shoot even faster than a thousand frames per second and even longer than two seconds. And hopefully we'll have even more to, to play with. But uh, I swear if, if enough people see this footage and they at least hear me talking about it and they start going out there and start recording the sky using this method, this is going to be old hat in no time. Everybody's going to forget about, you know, what I shot here. And this is going to be the new thing because everybody's going to say, wow, look, they're everywhere and everybody's getting them because if they're flying that fast, they're all over the place. And it's all, it reminds me of how the world worked before people knew about germs, you know, for almost all of human existence, nobody knew for sure what caused sickness. You know, germ theory wasn't even developed until the 1800s. Before then, most people thought that if you got sick, it was because you were breathing in bad air. And that's why, you know, you go to a doctor and the doctor wouldn't even wash his hands. You know, during the Civil War, they'd saw a guy's arm off and the next and saw his arm off, wouldn't even stop and wash their hands. And so this idea, when scientists came along and said, well, wait, wait. There are trillions and trillions and trillions of these incredibly tiny, invisible little bugs all over everything. <laughs> you, you can't see them, but just uh, trust me, they're, they're there and they're causing this. A lot of people thought, well, that was ridiculous. So if I tell you that there are thousands of UFOs that are flying probably over your house, certainly some of your houses, uh, every week, and you just can't see them, because you don't have the proper tool. It's like you couldn't see the germ without the microscope. You can't see these without the high-speed photography. It may sound like it's crazy, but eventually I don't think it's going to be crazy at all. And so um, that's sort of, uh, that's one of my latest obsessions is trying to document more of these things. There was a story about you that went viral on the time warp between El Las Vegas and Area 51. Yeah. And can you explain that? Yeah, that's one of my favorite um, results, I guess, in my years of research. In 2018, I was contacted by an engineer in Silicon Valley named Ronald Heath. And he was a big fan of the X-Files TV show. And he said that there was this episode of the X-Files in which uh, Mulder and Scully, they go out to some area in the woods where a UFO had recently been seen. And that uh, I think he said Mulder took two stopwatches and he synchronized them. And he left one in his car and he took the other one to the site where the UFO had been. And, and then later when he compared them, they were out of sync. And what this meant to him was that, well, these craft, they manipulate space and time. And so therefore when one lands, and then flies away, it kind of leaves a scar there, a space-time scar where it has manipulated gravity or something. That was what the point was, I believe. So Ronald, he said, man, I want to create an instrument that will, that will do something like that. And so he created, using his great skills, what he called the differential time rate meter, or DT meter. And essentially, it's a little plastic box, and it has a very sensitive circuit inside and it has a 100 foot cable that hooks to it. And the cable has a sensor on the end. And you stretch this out over a span of 100 feet and it's constantly sending and measuring signals that go back and forth between the two to compare them just like those two stopwatches. 
It's got a great filter in there. It filters out noise. Uh, there's, I mean, it, it, there's a lot of digits of just noise that are accounted for. But if it goes up to a certain reading, I think it's four digits past the decimal, then that means that a significant variation in the time between these two locations has occurred. And he asked me if I wanted to be the first person to test this thing out. I said, absolutely. So he sent this to me. And of course, I was living in Las Vegas, and I had been meaning to go up to Area 51 and, and do some research. And, and when I say that, look, I'm not affiliated with the government or anything like that. I'm talking about just going up there as a civilian and you know just doing my own UFO research in the area. And so um, I figured what I would do is I would take the two, two and a half hour drive up there and along the way, pull over on the side of the road every like five or 10 miles and just take what would be sort of a control reading where I'd get out and compare. And what I assumed might happen was as I got closer to Area 51, then uh, weird things would start happening. And then I'd get away from it and nothing weird would happen. That's what I was kind of thinking would be exciting. Well, it turns out, the whole place around Area 51 yielded no results that were special at all. However, much to my surprise, on this one little spot, this nondescript area on the side of the road, uh, just northwest of Las Vegas, in the middle of nowhere, I got this pretty remarkable reading. Uh, it, time slowed down about one one hundredth of a second. Now that, of course, sounds incredibly small, and it is, but it's actually gigantic when you consider it's not supposed to happen at all. And the only, unless you have a black hole that's approaching you or something like that, you're not supposed to get any deviation in time. And I was uh, knowing, you know, I, I, of course, I took all this data, I sent it to Ron, and he said, this is, yeah, this is astounding. Nobody's ever gotten a, a reading before. And I was the first person to, to test it, but he'd been testing it at his own house, his own units, and he'd never gotten anything. So after that, and this is what really blew my mind, I put out a little press release and said, I captured some kind of a strange time anomaly at this spot here, blah, blah, blah. And then after that, I found out that spot is one of the most famous UFO hotspots in the whole area, where people have been seeing UFOs for years. There was one guy who contacted me, and um, he actually, uh, and his story was documented, as a matter of fact. So I, he, he wasn't just making this up after, after the fact. In 1996, he was driving along that stretch of road late at night by himself, and he got to that section of the road, and here was a large triangular craft hovering over top of him, so big that he, he said he stopped his car, and it was over his head for several minutes. He said he could have almost spit on it. It was truly like something out of a Spielberg movie, and then this thing turned and glided off and then flew away into the sky. Um, and then on another occasion, I was contacted by a, a family that was driving through that area, and they had experienced three hours of missing time, and they were so freaked out, they just got online and started trying to see if there was an explanation, and then they found out about my work, and then there were truckers who were having these experiences. And so what it turns out that in the long run, I just happened to get lucky and stumble upon this spot where time seemed to deviate at that moment, and then later on found out it's a special spot where other people are experiencing things as well. Since then, I've been doing more research with the DT meter, and I have not been able to document another time anomaly. So that shows you just how fortunate I was that day. But I, that's another thing that I wish more people would try out, because when I did that, um, everybody said, well, this is crazy. You can't, there's no such thing as a time deviation here on Earth like that. But then afterward, another team of scientists used a similar method at um, Mesa Verde, I believe, and uh, they also documented a time anomaly. So these time anomalies do exist right here on Earth, and we're going to learn more and more as time goes on just how much more prevalent they are than we think they are. Has the scientific community looked into any of this data, and if so, what are their comments? 
Well, in ca in the case of the Mesa Verde story, which was on the History Channel, those were PhD physicists who conducted that research using lasers, and they got the same result that I did. As far as my actual research is concerned, there are a lot of scientists that contact me, I would say on a regular basis, at least you know six or seven from various disciplines, and they all are very interested in what I'm producing, but they don't want to be associated with this sort of thing. Because granted, it's now much more um, acceptable to talk about these anomalies than it was you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, it's still risky. And uh, you know, when your paycheck depends solely upon you keeping this job that you've worked for at this university for X amount of years, uh, it's understandable that you might not want to take risks that are not necessary. So I think that um, a lot of the scientific research, not surprisingly, is being conducted by the military because the military is able to do this stuff in secrecy. And um, they don't care whether it's going to hurt their reputation or not. I mean, you know, you, you hear these stories about that, you know, they, they blew like five million dollars or something like that to put a a, a microphone in a cat's ear one time and, uh, and it didn't work out because the cat got hit by a car within like two minutes you know <laughs> a spy cat you know and they go oh well and they just move on to the next project they they have the money to, to play around with like that and uh but so there are a lot of people i've been approached by people who are involved with military research who are interested in a lot of this but uh mainstream people you know they kind of keep a distance because one thing that's good about being who I am, Jeff, is that um, if I come out with something, if I discover something that's a little too close to the truth, I'm easy to discredit. They can just say, "Oh, well, that guy, he believes in ghosts, and you know, he sells wishing machines, and you know, he's just you know, that guy's a wacko." You know, I'm easy to blow off. That's good. That protects me. I can say whatever I want. I don't work for anybody in particular. Yes, I'm a host for iHeartRadio, but they contract me to do the show. I don't work for any government agency. I don't get any grants. Uh, and so, you know, I, I can, I'm pretty independent in that sense. And so, uh, but these, most of these people who have the credentials are not, so they don't have the same freedom that I have. Well, you mentioned that you had property next to Area 51. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. Did you just buy like a, a few acres with a house or what? Well, here's what happened. Um, <clears throat> two years ago, I finally decided to buy a house here in Vegas. Up until that point, I had been renting because I wanted to make sure that I wanted to settle down here. And because uh, I've lived in various places around the country, you know, I mentioned uh, off the air that my wife's family is from Texas. So I've even spent a good deal of time in Texas. And so um, we decided a couple of years ago to buy a house. And we're very happy with the house that we got, but there was a little unexpected surprise because as I was looking into Nevada real estate, uh, I was just curious about how much that land was going for in other parts of the state. And as I was just sort of randomly looking through listings, <laughs> I found that this guy had about three acres of land for sale right next to Area 51 basically as close as you can get without crossing a fence and breaking the law. And of course, uh, this is Rachel, Nevada. Most people who are familiar with Area 51, and they know of the little alien. It's about the only thing there is in Rachel, Nevada, uh, which is a, you know, it's a, a nice restaurant, actually really good food, restaurant, bar, little uh, motel there. And uh, other than that, I mean, the only people who live out there are pretty much, you know, farmers. You know, they grow alfalfa and stuff, but there's not much, much out there. So this guy had this plot of land for sale, unrestricted, do whatever you want with it. And even though it, it, it's not ideal to be in the process of purchasing an expensive home and then throw in this side deal, but I couldn't help it. So <laughs> I simultaneously bought my new house. And then I bought this land, having never even been there. I just paid cash and, and bought this land. And I was like, I can't believe it. I own land next to Area 51 now. And so uh, it took me a few months before I was able to make my first trip up there. 
the trip up there to this land was riddled with all kinds of weird synchronicities and things that are kind of creepy. I'll give you one example real quick. So uh, <laughs> I, I, was, I rented this brand new big SUV to make sure that it was, you know, we didn't break down or something. And I, I had uh, my wife, Lauren, and uh, three other friends, I guess, at the SUV. So here we are driving up. Uh, we'd already passed through this little town called Alamo, and we were heading toward Rachel. There was this was a nice, beautiful day, but there were basically no other cars around. We're driving through all these cliffs, and everything is pristine, and everything looks very neat, and nice, and clean. And then my my buddy Jason says, "Josh, did you see that?" I said, well, he said, "Pull over, pull over." So we backed up, and next to us. On this giant cliff is one word, and it's written in white paint, W-A-R-R-E-N. Now, my name is Joshua P. Warren. <laughs> Why in the would my name be written in giant letters on this cliff? I didn't tell anybody I was going up there. And there's no other explanation for that. There's no town called Warren around, or there's there's no there's no Warren connection. We never saw any other graffiti or anything like that. And of course, this gave me goosebumps. It gave all of us goosebumps. I shot a lot of pictures of it. One of my friends, Nick, even went up there, kind of crawled up to it and touched it. And he said it seemed pretty fresh to him. So was that a message to intimidate me in some way? I don't know. Is somebody just messing with me, playing mind games with me? Could very well be. I do know that I've heard stories about people who work at Area 51 doing that kind of thing just to, to mess with people. Sometimes they apparently even fly craft and uh, that are maybe weird or experimental, and then they'll go to a bar and start spreading the, the, the tale of the UFO and the aliens. You know, that's why you have all this misinformation. But the point is, now that I have this land, and it's a beautiful piece of land, it really is. It's very, very scenic. The only problem is when the sun goes down, if you if you turn on a UV light, you've never seen so many scorpions before. They, they, the place lights up like a Christmas tree, and these scorpions are as big as my hand. Um, but uh, so you got to I have very thick scorpion boots that I wear out there at night. But uh, my plan and this if, again, if there's any doubt that I am uh, a guy who can be easily dismissed as insane. My plan is to take everything that I have learned all these years about physics and metaphysics and psionics and radionics and psychotronics and ancient sacred geography and geometry and all these things and create something I've wanted to create for a long time, a portal opening machine. And I know this brings up images of Hellboy, but uh, I really do think that I have a design for a machine that when operated properly is going to, it's almost like, um, it's almost like if you have a bowl of water there and you want to get a vortex, well, you have to stir it the right way. That's what this will do. This will stir the environment in, a, in the right way using some very special materials that are hard to obtain. I've been going through this process, the supply chain issue, getting things from around the world now for the past two years. And I'm coming along. My prototype is almost finished. And when this device is complete, I'm going to take it up there. I'm going to test it out. If something bad happens, I can pull the plug and abandon the project just like that because I don't want to, you know, be responsible for anything negative coming through. Um, and I'm going to do it very gradually. But if this works out the way I think it's going to work out, then I'm going to be able to take an area that already is a paranormal hotspot and just add some fuel to that fire and open up some type of hopefully a, a 
not a negative, but an interesting Pandora's box that will allow us to document this activity more consistently than we ever have before. So that's something that you may be hearing more about in the next uh, couple of years, if not sooner, unless, of course, I get sucked into Oz and then you'll know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you are the creator of Parasymatics and the Sigil Lab. What are those? <laughs> um, well, um, you know, I've always been interested in this idea of magic. And to me, magic has to do with how that non-physical forces tend to become physical things. And... The best example of that is cymatics. In the late 1700s, early 1800s, there was this German physicist and musician named Ernst Chladny who discovered that he could take these thin sheets of metal and sprinkle sand or salt or some kind of particulate on top, and then he could stroke the edge with a violin bow and he would see the sand snap into all of these beautiful patterns, snowflake-like patterns. And um, this, of course, it, we're familiar with today as what, what we call cymatics, which is um, comes from an ancient Greek word for wave. And so you can reproduce this effect in uh, not just you know, sand and particulates, but in, in water, uh, if you if you use semi-liquid substances like uh, cornstarch and water, you can actually see these three D forms rise up, and it's a great way of visualizing tones and frequencies. And it truly is magic because you're taking again a vibration and using it to hold physical matter into place and shape physical reality. And so I I started doing a lot of experiments with cymatics, and when I was down in Puerto Rico. Um, I was using a lot of water to, to look at cymatics patterns. And I got this idea, um, cause you know, I was taking water from the Bermuda triangle and I was comparing it to other types of water. And I thought, what if instead of just playing a tone to get a shape, what if I also encoded a message in there so that for example, when I'm playing a tone, what if I also play my voice saying, I love you, or I am attracting more money, or I am manifesting a ghost? And I found that when I would say that, then the pattern would change, and I would capture some type of a pattern that represented the vibrations from the message that I put out there. We're talking about something that starts in my head, then moves down to my tongue and goes out of my mouth into this system that ex expresses it as this form on this water. And so I've always been interested in this idea of what's called a, a magical sigil. A sigil is a seal. It, it goes back to the Latin word sigillum, means to seal something. It's a symbol that uh, represents a certain vibration and it's used in magical rituals to seal things and they usually look nonsensical because they're abstract in many ways they're ca they're like antennas for a certain vibration so i thought what if i can take the form that mother nature shows me when i when i speak these messages into the water and turn that into a sigil a symbol and then expose myself to that what will happen so I, I created this setup where I would record myself saying a message or I would do it directly into a microphone. And then I would have this container of water there. And then I would have, of course, my speaker system there hooked to it. And then I would have an infrared light on it and an ultraviolet light on it and a laser light on it. And all those things would make the pattern pop even more. So I would videotape the pattern that, that came up, take it and sometimes compress all the images into one image, uh, put that into a computer program, print it out, 
So you have the actual photograph, and then I give it to, to I give it to my wife Lauren. My wife is a great artist, and she's very crafty, very talented. And I'd say, uh, Lauren, take this and just draw the highlights out. Uh, and literally with her hand, you know, take it and take a marker, just draw the highlights out and let's see what we get. So for example, I did one and I said, um, I'm attracting more money. And we saw the pattern that appeared and then she drew the highlights and this is what we got. We call this the money sigil. And then I said, um, I'm attracting, uh, oh yeah, I want to, I'm going to go on a ghost hunt. I'm, I'm, I'm attracting or manifesting a ghost. And we got this symbol. And and so on. And I've got, you know, a number of these. There's one for enhancing psychic power or there's one for attracting UFOs. And so I, I took these symbols and I would just start looking at them. And the first time I, I got the money sigil and I just started looking at the money sigil um, within, I think, three or four days out of the blue, I got this very big check that I was not expecting to get and I was pretty excited about it. And not too long after that, I was invited to go on Coast to Coast AM with George Nori. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to take some of these sigils and I'm going to put them on my website for free. And I'm just going to ask the audience to go to the website, save these images to your phone or your computer, or you can print them out, but just pick an image that you like and then just look at it as often as possible throughout the day and tell me what happens. Again, no charge, you don't have to sign up for anything. Just go, I get, my website's joshuapwarren.com. I said, go there and I had them all listed. I'm telling you, Jeff, within the next two weeks, I mean, the emails that came flooding, the thousands and thousands of emails that came flooding in was like nothing I'd ever seen before. So many people telling me, especially the money sigil, all people, I mean, it was like everybody loves the money sigil. They were telling me all these stories about getting new jobs, about hitting a lotto. Everybody near a casino was going and winning money. I had within two weeks, two people email me who had tattooed, permanently tattooed the money sigil on their arms. These are total strangers who heard me on the radio. And I realized that what I've done is I created a form of cymatics that goes one step beyond. I call it parasymatics. I coined that term, parasymatics. And so then people started saying, well, make one for like pet protection or, or make one for, uh, you know, like when I'm, uh, protection on a trip, staying safe on a trip. Or So I started making all these sigils and, uh, and putting them out there for free, never charging a penny for any of them, getting all this feedback. And then... People started contacting me saying, will you make me my own special sigil? Because I discovered that if you take a person's name and you use this parasymatic process and you turn that person's name into a sigil, when the person carries that sigil, whether it's you can just have a picture of it that you look at or you can wear it as a pendant or put it on a t-shirt, when you have your own sigil when you're exposed to your own personal sigil every day it's almost like a super boost it's like a bio boost that it, it just i think it overall increases your good fortune it's like superman when he's got the outfit on with the big s he's always superman even when he's clark kent but when he puts that outfit on and he's got the big s that's his sigil and now he's ready to be a superhero and so last year I started offering occasionally this service to create personalized sigils for people. And only once in a while, because again, we do these by hand. Every single one is done by hand. And so um, if you go to the sigillab.com, sigil spelled S-I-G-I-L. If you go to the sigillab.com, you can see free sigils there. You can find a, a link at the bottom of the page that you can click that has all these free sigils that I was talking about that you can experiment with for free. But if you want to purchase your own personalized sigil, if we're taking requests, then we will actually make you your own personalized sigil as well. Since we offered that, we've sold, I think about 400 so far. And let me tell you, the people who get them, again, you should see my emails. I mean, the stories go on and on. Here's what happens, somebody will buy one, and then they'll love it so much and all these good things happen. They turn around, they buy one for their son, their daughter, their employer. They just give them out as Christmas gifts. 
So the, this is amazing, but it also is very thought provoking because it's like, well, what does that mean? How does that work? How does this, what, and, and, and here's what I think it means. Um, we all can't speak English. You know, you can, you can speak English to a person who doesn't understand English and you're not going to be able to communicate or German or Chinese or whatever. But there are certain things that we do all have in common. That music, for example. People say music is the universal language. And a lot of people have speculated that if the aliens ever come back, just like in Close Encounters of the Third Kind, music will have something to do with the language that we use to interface with them. And what is music? Music is a tone. Music is a vibration. And we're using tones and vibrations to get these, these symbols. And, and look, this doesn't literally mean anything. This is just an abstract symbol that represents a tone. And so it doesn't matter what language you speak or what culture you're from. This transcends that. Some people say there's almost a tribal element to it. And so that's why I think these patterns are sort of like antennas, that they they captured that energy. And when you expose yourself to it, you just look at it. Uh, it's It does something to sort of like back engineer it. It's almost a form of broadcasting. What was put into it comes out of it, just like how an antenna used for broadcasting can either send or receive. Um, I send a vibration and an intention into this thing, and then you receive it. Um, and I think that's why these things have been around for thousands of years is magical sigils. And so that's the gist of parasymatic sigils and um, why that I've created the new sigil lab. What if you were making one for somebody, let's say their name is John Doe. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think about that specific John Doe that asked you to do this for them? Because... Would that same sigil work for all the John Doe's on planet Earth? That's an excellent question. I'm glad you asked it because you'd be surprised how few people ask that question. So I wondered the same thing. If I say, well, well, first off, let me tell you this. This kind of blows my mind. We did a sigil the other day for a guy, and his name was Jim Love, L-O-V-E. And when I spoke Jim Love, the most beautiful heart shape I've ever seen <laughs> appeared in the water. It was just like, that kind of thing gives me goosebumps. So if I say John and we see what appears in the water, and then I turn around and say, John again, is the same thing going to appear? If the conditions are exactly the same and I do it right away, it will look very, very similar. But if I go back the next day and do it, it may not look as similar. And I think that has to do with the, the reality that, you know how they say you can never dip your toe in the same river twice? Everything is always changing. And it may be that it represents something about that person at that particular time. But one thing that also plays into this is that, you know, identical twins have different fingerprints. Uh, that surprises a lot of people. So if you have identical twins and one commits a crime, they're going to be able to tell which one committed the crime, because even though they have the same DNA, there's still something different about them. And so I, I think that I, if I take two people who have the exact same name, but I know it's a different person, for one thing, I'm never going to be able to say the name exactly the same way twice. The conditions are going to be changed ever so slightly because the world is in a state of constant flux. And so I think that in some cases, like I say, if I do it within a certain period of time, there's going to be more of a similarity. But I can't say that it would ever be possible for two people who have the same name to get the same outcome because that everybody is completely unique and I sit down and I, I treat each person as a unique person. But there is a subjective side to this because obviously I am the one who's speaking the name and then my wife is the one who's pulling out the highlights. So I consider this to be a blend of art and science. And that's 
Possibly, however, a more realistic way of tapping into some of these uh, mysterious energy fields because, you know, humans are not robots and um, you can't just completely separate people into one category or another. For example, um, you know, sometimes I hear people talk about um, objective empirical evidence on a paranormal investigation. And I always have to point out, well, whoa, whoa, before you start talking about all these measurements and all this data, this meter that you're using here was invented by a human, uh, created by a human, assembled by a human, calibrated by a, a human, used by a human, interpreted by a human. You can't ever remove the human element from technology. That, that's an illusion that there is such a thing as true objectivity. And so reality is acknowledging that, that some things are more objective that we share in common, that we can agree upon, and some things are more subjective, like your dreams or your hallucinations. But both of those components are almost like the left and right side of the brain. They're both hemispheres that are necessary to capture the true essence of what we experience in reality. And I think that this process called parasymatics, because it blends art and science, is probably a very good representation of how those two aspects of the human experience coexist. I saw somewhere either on your website or your YouTube channel something about the Bigfoot tooth necklace. Yeah. What is that? And, does, <laughs> and while we're at it, what do you think the connection is between Bigfoot and ETs and UFOs? Right. Well, let's start with the connection then. Um, when people talk about seeing Bigfoot and they say, I believe that Bigfoot is just a, a normal biological ape of some kind that is undiscovered, that we will one day capture in a cage like a mountain gorilla, um, I just can't bring myself to believe there's enough evidence for that explanation. And that is because that we're talking about an animal in that case that would be 800, 1200 pounds covered in hair. And this creature would have to have a population of some kind to sustain itself. And people report seeing them in all 50 states every year. So there should be a lot more hair, a lot more scat. Uh, many more footprints, much more of an impact on the ecology. You know, you can go, I've, I've done some pretty extensive hiking in the mountains, uh, both the uh, Appalachian and the Pacific Northwest. You can be in some pretty remote areas by yourself and you look down and you find a beer can. I mean, humans have been out and explored quite a bit. We have satellites everywhere. So I don't think we can we can explain Bigfoot as a normal biological ape that someday will be captured in that way. But I do, however, believe that people are telling the truth often when they see this thing. And the only way I can reconcile that is if we are talking about some type of a creature that is not a normal biological entity. You see, when, when these interdimensional type creatures come here, and I wrote a book, got a copy of it somewhere here called Pet Ghost that came out a long time ago where I talked about animal spirits and interdimensionals. Um, when an interdimensional being appears in our dimension, you might think that it's going to look all fuzzy and translucent and have a glow around it, but no, 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 that's not how it usually is. Apparently, when they are here, they are fully physical and tangible, but then they disappear. They go somewhere else, and that's why you have all these stories about people following Bigfoot, and then all of a sudden he just vanishes. That the or that you you see the tracks. They they just stop mid trail. Where did Bigfoot go? And uh, in fact, there was an interesting documentary that came out uh, just months ago. I uh, I think it, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, something it was. But anyway, it's about paranormal Bigfoot, and it had some pretty good documents in it, um, and and pretty good stories about people who had seen Bigfoot teleport. And then you have um, like these stories about uh, aliens and, you know, not only do the aliens vanish, but they also create time distortions. And let's, let's think about the connection there for a second. Well, space and time 
are connected, according to scientists, into this thing called space-time. You can't change one without changing the other. So if Bigfoot has changed his location, his space, then that means he's also changed his time. And then when it comes to UFOs, people encounter UFOs, they have missing time. Or you have the stories about like the guy and going down the road in Texas and he sees the UFO over top of the truck and the truck stops and he's sitting there looking at the UFO and then it flies away and then the truck starts working again. It's not like that he has to turn the ignition. It's like the time was paused and yet his brain wasn't paused and that's because your brain is its own separate time machine. That's what memories are and that's why you can think what happened yesterday and you can predict what's going to happen tomorrow. Ghosts are often things that are seen from another point in time, usually the past, sometimes the future, sometimes even the present. Uh, ghost doubles appear at other places. So time is this central component. Time is always manipulated. And in one of my books called The Secret Wisdom of Kukulkan, I talked about what's called the paratemporal loop hypothesis, which digs into the idea that the common denominator between most paranormal phenomena is time manipulation, temporal distortion, because all these things are capable of somehow uh, morphing space-time and in a way that uh, takes them in and out of our timelines and our own perception. Now, of course, if you are the type of person who wants to go out and study these things, um, you know, it's, it's funny because I have people who contact me and they say, do you have a sigil to stop activity? I, I, I want to neutralize the ghosts. I don't want to see anything. I say, yes, I do. You know, that's a, that's a free one you can get there. But if you're like me and you're one of these wackos who wants to go out and, and see a ghost or a Bigfoot, um, I think that really preparing your mind for it is, is, is a big step. I mean, after all, you are your mind. I think, therefore, I am. And so that's why when you start focusing on any goal, um, you have to keep envisioning it. That's what basic manifestation and basic law of attraction is about. You have to start envi envisioning what you want if you want to work toward making it a reality. And so if you want to go out and research Bigfoot, I've thought about what you need to do. I have a friend named Christian McLeod, and he is, uh, that's his big thing. He loves Bigfoot, all, cryptids of all kind. And I'm always, he's always asking me for tips on how to, how to go out and have an experience. Well, I like to collect all kinds of unusual items. As a matter of fact, on my YouTube channel, Joshua P. Warren YouTube channel, you'll see that um, I recently gave a tour of just some of the things I have in my house some of the weird things I collect. And I like to collect anything physical that represents something that has, you know, like a paranormal or strange reputation. And um, I was recently looking over some fossils uh, from Morocco online, and I saw that this guy had uh, plesiosaur teeth for sale. And immediately I was like, oh, that's really cool because a lot of people think that the Loch Ness Monster is a plesiosaur that was left over from millions of years ago and is trapped in Loch Ness. And a plesiosaur is not technically a dinosaur. It's sort of its own thing. But uh, so, but I thought, yeah, that would be really cool to uh, to have a, a Nessie tooth, you know. So I bought some of these plesiosaur teeth for my collection. And then once I started thinking about that and going down that road... I was um, I started thinking about other cryptids and I was like, well, you know, a lot of people have said that Bigfoot might be a leftover Gigantopithecus. And Gigantopithecus is the largest ape that has ever lived. I mean, I, this thing was, I can't remember, like eight or 10 feet tall, you know. And so uh, I thought, boy, that would be wonderful if I could have a Gigantopithecus tooth next to my Nessie Plesiosaur tooth. And so I started looking for a Gigantopithecus tooth and realized, like, oh, no, buddy, you're not getting one of those. That's like holy grail stuff. I mean, they, there's only a handful of them out there, and they're all in museums, and they're priceless. So I had no hope of getting a hold of a Gigantopithecus tooth. But I thought, well, what's the next best thing? Uh, let me get a, a replica of a Gigantopithecus jaw 
because they do have replicas you can get of the jaws and then use that to sculpt a two scale version of a gigantopithecus tooth and uh, going back to my wife she's the one with all the crafty talent so I I gave her this project. She's she's always like, "What is it going to be now, Josh?" <laughs> it's like we're going to make this gigantopithecus tooth. So she sculpted this beautiful actual, actual two scale model of a gigantopithecus tooth, and then I took it to a company here in Las Vegas and had them three D scan it, and then and then print out some of these in three D, like you know three D printed gigantopithecus teeth, strung them up on a necklace. And uh, said, okay, I think I made, not. there wasn't many, maybe like 50 or something. And then I said, if you're into Bigfoot, try wearing this and see if it attracts Bigfoot. I don't know, you know. And so I, I sent some out to my, my friends who do this kind of research. And so far, I've heard of three people who claim that they have seen a Bigfoot while wearing this thing. So it hasn't been a big, big project for me, but I like doing fun stuff like that. And I think we, you know, we still have some of those left. You can dig around and find them. Uh, my website says, well, it's, there's probably a video on my YouTube channel about that as well. I, I A lot of times if I come out with a product, I always try to uh, make a little YouTube video about it. Um, but, uh, you know, to me, that's part of the fun in life. Like I say, you know, I don't get any grants or loans, and uh, all the money that I make comes from the research that I do and how that I can turn that into something that people find interesting enough to want to support and to pay for, whether that's a product or watching a show or listening to my podcast or whatever. And so that's one of the things that I had a lot of fun doing, uh, bringing a gigantopithecus tooth back. And I don't think anybody else has ever done that. So uh, that's, to my knowledge, the only place you'll find one of those if you're into Bigfoot. Well, if they have the necklace and a Bigfoot sigil, if you make yes. it, they'll be double lucky. That's exactly right. <laughs> you get your mind right there in the zone where you need to be. But, you know, I, I've I've been on Bigfoot hunts, uh, interested in Bigfoot, but I just, um, I don't really dig too deep into Bigfoot because that um, I don't think that you can really document these interdimensional creatures so easily. You know, I don't think you can go on a camping trip for a few days and, and you know, catch a Bigfoot. So, yeah, I think you're better off to just focus on, uh, you know, cameras and trying to use things that you would use to capture any type of a ghostly phenomenon. For those people out there that want to become paranormal investigators, what kind of advice do you have for them? Well, you know, I have got, I have three warehouses at least, um, well, we'll say storage units in one warehouse strewn across this country, packed from wall to wall, floor to ceiling with every kind of technology you can imagine. I've got all the gadgets, all the gizmos. I've got all the lab equipment. I've got Tesla coils and Wimshurst generators and Van de Graaff generators and vacuum chambers and just... I, there's no telling how much money I've just wasted <laughs> on, on all of this stuff over the years. And and actually, you know, I'm, I'm the biggest geek in the world. I, I love it. And so people contact me and they say, well, uh, what should I buy? You know, what kind of a piece of equipment do I need to go out and do this or that to get started, whether it's researching ghosts or UFOs or cryptids or psychic phenomena? And I tell every one of them the same thing. Before you spend a penny on a piece of equipment, um, go to my website, joshuapwarren.com. Go to the Curiosity Shop. There is a, a section of PDFs that you can buy there. And I think you can get five different ones for like $9.95. Okay, it's practically nothing. Less than $10 for five of these. One of them is called Poor Man's Paranormal. And I wrote this as a guide to using household items, things that you probably already have in your house right now that you're not doing anything with, in order to conduct some pretty darn reliable paranormal research. And the great thing about it is that um, not only is it an instructional guide, but it also allows you to understand more about how the thing works 
I mean, like if I give you an EMF meter and say, here, go ghost hunting, and you don't know how an EMF meter works, then you may say, oh, I'm getting something, I'm getting something, but that doesn't really mean anything to you. But if you read my book, Poor Man's Paranormal, and I say, hey, forget the EMF meter right now. Go get a compass, just a simple compass. I always keep a compass around. This is a my, one of my favorite compasses because I bought this in Transylvania, in Romania, in this weird little shop underground <laughs> uh, back in 2012. And it's, I don't know, it's, it's definitely vintage. It almost looks like it could be World War I. It's got brass on it. And I always keep this compass near me. And that's because that a compass should always point north. And if suddenly it stops pointing north, when you're not touching it, if it's just sitting there especially, if it starts deviating away from north, or especially if it starts spinning, well, then there is some kind of magnetic or electromagnetic anomaly that is around that compass. Now, you might be able to look and find that you know something has changed in the room that's causing a magnetic field. But if you can't explain it, this is the easiest ghost hunting tool in the world is a compass. Because if you see that compass start spinning around, you better start taking pictures. Uh, that because that's a good time to capture something paranormal. Now, not only what is that very effective, but you can also kind of understand how it works because you're already familiar with how a compass works and you know you can take pieces of metal or a magnet and kind of mess around with the compass. Um, <clears throat> another thing is let's say let's say you want to hunt for um for uh UFOs. Okay, I'll give you another simple one here. My throat gets really dry here in the desert, you can imagine. Um, so let's say you want to hunt for UFOs <clears throat> and you want to, uh, determine the best way to go out at night and be alerted if there may be a UFO that's going to appear, what kind of advanced technology do you need? All you need in most cases is a, an AM radio, because if you go out to a location, you can use your car radio or just get a little handheld cheapo you can buy at the dollar store. Put it on a blank AM station so you just hear static. And then set that up in your vicinity. And most of the time, when an impressive UFO is approaching, that static will start to go... It'll really start making a bunch of weird, outstanding noises because that's interference that's coming through as the electromagnetic field around this craft is moving through our atmosphere. And as a matter of fact, sometimes you can even take those out to uh, like a meteor shower and you can hear it crackle when the meteors fall down through the atmosphere. And so when you start hearing that radio give you those weird interference crackles, uh, that's when you know it's time to look up. It's time to start you know, taking your pictures, using your night vision, whatever it is. Um, if you're going to go out and hunt for Bigfoot, you know, I tell you the, the simplest way to make a, a casting substance. You know, if you don't have plaster of Paris on hand, I tell you how to take, you know, like flour and salt and some basic stuff that you probably have in your kitchen. Because if you find a, a footprint outside and you don't have plaster of Paris and you want to document it quickly, well, here's what you do. You go to your kitchen, you get this stuff. And I'm telling you, this may not give you the results that you would get if you had you know, $100,000 worth of equipment there. But it does a pretty darn solid job of not only allowing you to document these paranormal things, but also to be able to do it on the spur of the moment, you know, so that if, if, you, if you need to document something and you don't have the proper gear, you can get your hands on it quickly. You're like MacGyver, you know, you can take all this stuff and you can hook it, to, hook it together and do what you need to do to document it while you can. And uh, I even have emails I get from people, uh, parents, who say that they have taken this book, uh, which is very simple, uh, easy to read, and they have parties, uh, poor man paranormal parties, where they get kids together and stuff. And the kids build these paranormal investigation tools in an evening, and they learn about science. And then they go out and they use it in the backyard, and they go ghost hunting or Bigfoot hunting. So that is the easiest thing to do is just to go to joshuapwarren.com, get that PDF, Poor Man's Paranormal. And then if you 
are really interested, uh, you find out what you like, find out what you enjoy, and then you can start investing money into more serious equipment if that's what you want to do. But uh, whatever you buy, it doesn't do you any good unless you read the instructions. And you know what? You, if you have an EMF meter, it's not going to really do you any good unless you know what an electromagnetic field is. You'd be surprised, Jeff, how many people are running around out there calling themselves investigator this, investigator that. And you say to that person, do you uh, know what the scientific method is? Do you know what the steps of the scientific method are? Most of them do not. And it's not that hard. You go out and you observe things. You look for patterns and correlations, cause and effect. You go out and you develop a hypothesis if you've got one. And you test that hypothesis. Maybe it becomes a theory. You know, it's, there are basic steps you go through. And people don't know about pareidolia, that tendency to see the man in the moon or to take, you know, random patterns out there. And uh, I'm seeing a face in an orb over here, even though it's just a speck of dust. Or people don't know about confirmation bias, where they go out and they look for evidence that supports what they want to believe while dismissing the things that, the, that don't support what they want to believe. You, if you're going to seriously do this, and you just, you're doing it just for your own fun, fine. But if you're going to be like me, and you're going to get out there and you're going to present stuff to, to the public, you're going to get criticized. People are going to tear you apart. And you have to, to know enough about what you're doing so that you can explain what you've got, why you think it's important, and you can defend yourself if you need to. Um, and that's why, you know, if I put a piece of footage out there, like some of my UFO stuff, I'm not claiming that I know what it is. That's why it's called a UFO. I'm just saying, here's where I shot it. Here's when I shot it. Here's the, the, you know, the time of day. Here's what the weather was like. Here's the camera I used. Here are the original files. Here are the witnesses. And then, you know, you can look at all that. But regardless of what I get, like I say, don't believe me. You go do it for yourself, okay? Use me as inspiration. Take what I did. You go buy your own camera. You go do it. And then you tell me that what you got was a bird. <laughs> Joshua, we're running out of time, but before we go, I want to let people know how to find you. Do they find all your social media in one place like your website? Well, you know what? The very best thing to do is go to joshuapwarren.com. There is no period after the P. And if you go there, um, right there on the homepage, you will see it says in Slimer green letters, uh, sign up for Joshua's free e-newsletter. If you do that, it just takes you two seconds. You put your email address in there, hit submit. I can keep you directly updated on these projects. But better than that is as soon as you sign up, you'll receive an automated email from me that's got some links to some free online goodies. Okay, so you get a free book. You get a free good luck charm. Uh, you get some free money manifestation tips. All this stuff for, just for signing up. And also... As I mentioned, my work is supported through all the objects and inventions that I sell on my curiosity shop. And here's a discount code for all of your viewers. If you just go to uh, my curiosity shop and put in D10BBB, and when you check out, that'll give you a discount on some of the things in the shop. And then, uh, of course, uh, we are taking requests for uh, personalized sigils um, probably for the next week or so, uh, sigillab.com. So that's where you go if you want to find out everything that's going on. Sign up for the newsletter. Uh, at least check out the stuff in the Curiosity Shop. If you don't buy anything, you'll have fun looking at it. <laughs> and uh, and then also at the sigillab.com, there are a lot of free sigils there you can experiment with. And um, I feel like that, you know, these everything I do is uh, is an experiment. And hey, if, if you gain something from it, then fantastic. If not, no harm done. But uh, one thing's for sure, if the if, if work that I was doing wasn't connecting with a lot of people, then uh, I would have been out of business a long time ago. Joshua, before we wrap it up, can you leave us with one last positive message? I guess the most positive message is that ultimately, 
something that you think of that is good is always going to be more powerful than something that is bad. And it's actually kind of a good thing that we don't have that power that Jedis have, like Darth Vader, where you could just go like and choke somebody because you'd probably do that in traffic a lot and get in trouble and you don't really mean it. So time is your friend. Time is your friend. And time allows you to focus on the things that you really want. So even if you have negative feelings, if you have negative thoughts, if you have self-doubts, that's common, that's natural, we all do. But if you make a conscious effort every single day to think positively about what you want and you are consistent, then eventually it must come to pass. It must come to pass because it is going to be much, much, much more powerful than any of those doubtful negative things that you have that are always trying to interfere with what you want to manifest and materialize. And if you want to have uh, even more information on how you can positively focus, even if you think that you, you say, I can't visualize, I don't know how to do it, I give you free tips. You can get a free PDF from my website, a book called Use the Force, A Jedi's Guide to the Law of Attraction. It's in English and Spanish. Just click the link to the book cover on my website. It's got all those tips in there. And so a positive thought is much more powerful than a negative one. And that's the good news because you can overcome anything negative as long as you stay focused on things that are good. Joshua, thank you for your message. And thank you for being my guest. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.